Welcome to English Fables for Learn English. The story name is Lord Mount Drago. Dr. Odlin looked at the clock on his desk. It was 20 minutes to 6. He was surprised that his patient was late, for Lord Mount Drago was always proud of his punctuality. There was in Dr. Odlin's appearance nothing to attract attention. He was not more than 50, but he looked older. His eyes, pale blue and rather large, were tired and inexpressive. When you had been with him for a while you noticed that they moved very little, they remained fixed on your face. His clothes were dark. His tie was black. He gave you the impression of a very sick man. Dr. Odlin was a psychotherapist. He could relieve certain pains by the touch of his cool, soft hand, and by talking to his patients often induced sleep in those who were suffering from sleeplessness. He spoke slowly. His voice had no particular color, but it was musical, soft, and soothing. Dr. Odlin found that by speaking to people in that low monotonous voice of his, by looking at them with his pale, quiet eyes, by stroking their foreheads with his long firm hands, he could sometimes do things that seemed miraculous. He restored speech to a man who had become dumb after a shock and he gave back the use of his limbs to another who had been paralyzed after a plane crash. He could not understand his power that came from he knew not where, that enabled him to do things for which he could find no explanation. He had been practicing now for fifteen years and had a wonderful reputation in his speciality. Though his fees were high, he had as many patients as he had. Time to see. And what had he not seen of human nature during the fifteen years that patients had been coming to his dark room in Wimpole Street? The confessions that he heard during these years ceased to surprise him. Nothing could shock him any longer. He knew by now that men were liars, he knew how unlimited was their vanity, he knew far worse things about them, but he knew that it was not for him to judge or to condemn. It was a quarter to six. Of all the strange patients he had had, Dr. Odlin could remember none stranger than Lord Mount Drago. It was an able and noble man who was appointed Secretary of Foreign Affairs when he was still under forty. He was considered the ablest politician in the Conservative Party and for a long time directed the foreign policy of his country. Lord Mount Drago had many good qualities. He had intelligence and industry. He traveled in the world and spoke several languages. He had courage, insight and determination. He was a good speaker, clear, precise and often witty. He was a tall, handsome man, a little too stout, but this gave him respectability. At twenty-four he had married a girl of eighteen whose father was a duke and her mother a great American heiress, so that she had both position and wealth, and by her he had two sons. For several years they had lived privately apart, but in public united, and their behavior did not give ground for gossip. Shortly speaking, he had a great deal to make him a popular and successful figure. He had unfortunately great defects. He was a horrible snob. He had beautiful manners when he wanted to display them, but this he did only with people he regarded as his equals. 
He was coldly rude to those whom he looked upon as his social inferiors. He often insulted his servants and his secretaries. He knew that he was a great deal cleverer than most of the persons he had to deal with, and never hesitated to demonstrate it to them. He felt himself born to command and was irritated with people who expected him to listen to their arguments or wished to hear the reasons for his decisions. He was extraordinarily selfish. It never occurred to him that he could do something for others. He had many enemies, he despised them. He had no friends. He was unpopular with his party, and yet his merit was so great, his patriotism so evident, his intelligence so prominent and his management of affairs so brilliant, that they had to put up with him. And Sometimes he could be enchanting, you were surprised at his wide knowledge and his excellent taste. You thought him the best company in the world, you forgot that he had insulted you the day before and was quite capable of killing you the next. Lord Mount Drago almost failed to become Dr. Audlin's patient. A secretary rang up the doctor and told him that the Lord wished to consult him and would be glad if he would come to his house at ten o'clock on the following morning. Dr. Audlin answered that he was unable to go to Lord Mount Drago's house, but would be glad to give him an appointment at his consulting room at five o'clock on the next day. The secretary took the message and presently rang again to say that Lord Mount Drago insisted on seeing Dr. Audlin in his own house and the doctor could fix his own fee. Dr. Audlin replied that he saw patients only in his consulting room and expressed his regret that unless Lord Mount Drago was prepared to come to him he could not give him his attention. In a quarter of an hour a brief message was delivered to him that his lordship would come not next day but the same day, at five. When Lord Mount Drago then entered the room he did not come forward but stood at the door and silently looked the doctor up and down. Dr. Audlin saw that he was in a rage. It seems that it is as difficult to see you as a Prime Minister, Dr. Audlin. I'm extremely busy. I think I should tell you I'm His Majesty's Secretary for Foreign Affairs, he said acidly. Won't you sit down, said the doctor. Lord Mount Drago made a gesture as if he was about to go out of the room but then he changed his mind and sat down. Dr. Audlin opened a large book and took his pen. He wrote without looking at his patient. How old are you? Forty-two. Are you married? Yes. Have you any children? I have two sons. Dr. Audlin leaned back in his chair and looked at his patient. He did not speak, he just looked, gravely, with pale eyes that did not move. Why have you come to see me, he asked at last. I've heard about you. You have a very good reputation. People seem to believe in you. Why have you come to me? repeated Dr. Audlin. Now it was Lord Mount Drago's turn to be silent. It looked as if he found it hard to answer. Dr. Audlin waited. At last Lord Mount Drago began to speak. I'm in perfect health. I work hard, but I'm never tired, and I enjoy my work. It is very important. The decisions I make can affect the situation of the country and even the peace of the world. 
I must have a clear brain. I look upon it as my duty to eliminate any cause of worry that may interfere with my work. Dr. Audlin had not taken his eyes off him. He saw that behind his patient's pompous manner was an anxiety that he could not conceal. Lord Mount Drago paused and then spoke again. The whole thing's so trivial that I'm afraid you'll just tell me not to be a fool and waste your valuable time. Even things that seem very trivial may have their importance. They can be a symptom of a deep-seated disturbance. And my time is at your disposal. Dr. Audlin's voice was low and strangely soothing. After hesitation Lord Mount Drago decided to be frank. The fact is, he said, I've been having some very strange dreams lately. I know it's silly to pay any attention to them, but, well, the truth is that I'm afraid they've got on my nerves. Can you describe any of them to me? They're so idiotic, I can hardly tell you about them. I'm listening. Well, the first I had was about a month ago. I dreamt that I was at a party at Connemara House. It was an official party. The king and the queen were to be there, and many prominent people too. Suddenly I saw a little man there called Owen Griffiths, who's a member of parliament from the Labour Party, and to tell you the truth, I was surprised to see him there. The Connemaras were at the top of a marble staircase receiving their guests. Lady Connemara gave me a look of surprise when I shook hands with her, and began to giggle, I didn't pay attention, she's a very silly woman and her manners are very bad. I walked through the reception rooms, nodding to a number of people and shaking hands, then I saw the German ambassador talking with one of the Austrian dukes. I wanted to talk with him so I went up and held out my hand. The moment the duke saw me he burst into a roar of laughter. I was deeply hurt. I looked him up and down, but he only laughed the more. I was. about to speak to him rather sharply when there was a sudden hush, and I realized that the king and the queen had come. Turning my back on the duke, I stepped forward and then, quite suddenly, I noticed that I hadn't got my trousers on. No wonder Lady Connemara and the duke had laughed. I can't tell you what I felt at that moment. An agony of shame. I awoke in a cold sweat. Oh, what relief it was to find it was only a dream. It's the kind of dream that is not so very uncommon, said Dr. Audlin. Of course. But an odd thing happened next day. I was in the lobby of the House of Commons when that fellow Griffiths walked slowly past me. He looked down at my legs, and then he looked me full in the face, and I was almost certain he winked. A ridiculous thought came to me. He was there the night before and saw how everybody were laughing at me. But, of course, I knew that was impossible because it was only a dream. I gave him an icy look, and he walked on. But he continued to grin. Lord Mount Drago took his handkerchief out of his pocket and wiped his hands. Dr. Audlin didn't take his eyes off him. Tell me another dream, said he. It was the night after, 
and it was even more absurd than the first one. I dreamt that I was in the parliament. There was a debate on foreign affairs which was very important not only for the country but for the whole world. Of course, the house was crowded. I was to make a speech in the evening. I had prepared it carefully. I wanted it to produce an effect in the parliament and to silence my enemies. I rose to my feet. There was a dead silence when I began to speak. Suddenly I noticed that odious little Griffiths, the Welsh member, on one of the opposite benches, he put out his tongue at me. I don't know if you've ever heard a vulgar music hall song called A Bicycle Made for Two. It was very popular many years ago. To show Griffiths how completely I despised him I began to sing it. The house listened to me in stony silence and I felt that something was wrong. When I started the third verse the members began to laugh. In an instant the laughter spread, the ambassadors, the guests, the ladies in the ladies' gallery, the reporters, they shook, they held their sides, they rolled in their seats, everyone was dying with laughter, except the ministers on the front bench, behind me. In that unprecedented noise they sat petrified. I looked at them and suddenly absurdity of what I had done fell upon me. I had made myself the laughingstock of the whole world. I realized that I should have to resign. I woke and I knew it was only a dream. When Lord Mount Drago finished he was pale and he trembled. But with an effort he pulled himself together. The whole thing was so fantastic that I didn't think about it anymore. When I went into the house on the following afternoon I was in a very good form. The debate was dull but I had to be there, and to read some documents. For some reason I looked up, and I saw that Griffiths was speaking. I couldn't imagine that he had anything to say that was worth listening to and I was about to return to my papers when he quoted two lines from A Bicycle Made for Two. I glanced at him and I saw that his eyes were fixed on me. I tried to read my papers again but I found it difficult to concentrate on them. Was it a mere coincidence that he had just quoted? those two lines. I asked myself if it was possible that he was dreaming the same dreams as I was. But of course the idea was absurd, and I decided not to give it a second thought. There was silence. Dr. Audlin looked at Lord Mount Drago and Lord Mount Drago looked at Dr. Audlin. I'll tell you one more dream I had a few days ago. I dreamed that I went into a public house in Limehouse. I've never been in a public house since I was at Oxford and yet I felt at home there. I went into a room, there was a fireplace and a large armchair on one side of it, and a long bar on the other. It was a Saturday night, and the place was packed. It seemed to me that most of the people there were drunk. There was a gramophone playing, and in front of the fireplace two women were doing a grotesque dance. I went up to have a look, and some man said to me, Have a drink, Bill. He gave me a glass of beer and I drank it. One of the women who were dancing came up to me and took the glass. You come and have a dance with me, she said. Before I could protest she had caught hold of me and we were dancing together. 
And then I found myself sitting in the armchair with that woman on my lap and we were drinking beer from the same glass. I should tell you that sex has never played any great part in my life. I've always been too busy to give much thought to that kind of thing, and living so much in the public eye as I do, it would be madness to do anything that could give rise to scandal. I despise the men who ruin their careers for women. The woman I had on my lap was drunk, she wasn't pretty and she wasn't young, in fact she was just a cheap old prostitute. But I wanted her. I heard a voice. That's right, old chap, have a good time. I looked up, and there was Owen Griffiths. You know, I wasn't so much annoyed at his seeing me in that absurd situation as angry that he addressed me as old chap. I don't know you, and I don't want to know you, I said. I know you well, he said, and my advice to you, Molly, is, see that you get your money, he'll cheat you if he can. There was a bottle of beer standing on the table. Without a word I seized it and hit him over the head with it as hard as I could. I made such a violent gesture that it woke me up. There is nothing special in this story, said Dr. Audlin. The story's idiotic. I've told it you for what happened next day. I went to the library of the house, got a book and began reading. I hadn't noticed that Griffiths was sitting in a chair close by me. Another of the labor members came in and went up to him. Hello, Owen, he said to him, you're looking pretty bad today. I've got an awful headache, he answered. I feel as if I'd been hit over the head with a bottle. Now Lord Mount Drago's face was grey with pain. I knew then that the idea which I considered absurd was true. I know that Griffiths was dreaming my dreams and that he remembered them as well as I did. Have you any idea why this same man should come into your dreams? None. Dr. Audlin's eyes had not left his patient's face and he saw that he was lying. The dream you've just described to me took place over three weeks ago. Have you had any since? Every night. And does this man Griffiths come into them all? Yes. Dr. Audlin drew a line or two on his paper. It often took a long time to make people tell the truth, and yet they knew that unless they told it he could do nothing for them. Dr. Audlin, you must do something for me. I shall go mad if this goes on. I'm afraid to go to sleep. But I must have sleep. With all the work I have to do I need. Rest, sleep brings me none. As soon as I fall asleep my dreams begin, and he's always there, that vulgar little cad, laughing at me, mocking me, despising me. He has seen me do things that are so horrible, so shameful that even if my life depended on it I wouldn't tell them. It can't go on. If you can't do something to help me I shall either kill myself or kill him. Can you give any reason why this particular man persists in coming into your dreams? Have you ever done him any harm? Never. Are you quite sure? Quite sure. You don't seem to understand that our ways lead along different paths. 
I must remind you that I am a minister and Griffiths is an ordinary member of the Labour Party. Naturally, we could not possibly have anything in common. I can do nothing for you unless you tell me the complete truth. Have you done anything to this man that he might look upon as an injury? Lord Mount Drago hesitated. He looked away and then, as though there were in Dr. Audlin's eyes a force that he could not resist, looked back. He answered reluctantly. Only if he was a dirty foolish little cad. But that is exactly what you've described him as. Lord Mount Drago sighed. He was beaten. The silence lasted two or three minutes. I'm ready to tell you everything that can be of any use to you. If I didn't mention this before, it's only because it was so unimportant that I didn't see how it could possibly have anything to do with the case. Griffiths won a seat at the last election and it appeared that he imagined himself a minister of foreign affairs. From the beginning I hated the way he talked, his vulgar Welsh accent and his shabby clothes. I must admit, that he was a rather good orator and had a certain influence over the minds of the members of his party. He calls himself an idealist. He talks all that silly rubbish the intelligentsia have been boring us for years with. Social justice, the brotherhood of men, and so on. The worst of it was that. It impressed not only his own party, but even some of the silliest members of ours. It was likely that Griffiths could get the foreign office when a labor government came in. One day I happened to visit a debate on foreign affairs which Griffiths had opened. He'd spoken for an hour. I thought it was a very good opportunity to cook his goose, and really, Sir, I cooked it. In the House of Commons the most devastating weapon is mockery. I mocked him. I was in a good form that day and the house rolled with laughter. And if ever a man was made a fool of, I made a fool of Griffiths. When I sat down I'd killed him. I'd destroyed his prestige forever. He had no more chance of getting office than the policeman at the door. But that was no business of mine. I heard afterwards that his father, the old miner, and his mother had come up from Wales with various supporters of his to watch the triumph they expected him to have. They had seen his humiliation. So I can say that you ruined his career. He brought it on himself. Have you ever felt sorry about it? I think perhaps if I'd known that his father and mother were there, I would have let him down a little more gently. There was nothing more for Dr. Audlin to say, and at the end of an hour he dismissed him. Since then Dr. Audlin had seen Lord Mount Drago half a dozen times. He had done him no good. The dreams continued every night, and it was clear that his general condition was getting worse. Dr. Audlin came to the conclusion at last that there was only one way in which Lord Mount Drago could get rid of his dreams but he knew him well enough to be sure that he would never, never take it of his own free will. In order to save Lord Mount Drago from a breakdown he must be induced to take a step that was against his pride and his nature. He was sure that it was necessary to do it immediately. During one of the shows of hypnosis he put him to sleep. 
With his low, soft, monotonous voice he repeated the same words over and over again. Lord Mount Drago lay quite still, his eyes closed, his breathing regular, and his limbs relaxed. Then, Dr. Audlin in the same quiet tone spoke the words he had prepared. You will go to Owen Griffith and say that you are sorry that you caused him that great injury. You will say that you will do all you can to undo the harm that you have done him. The words acted on Lord Mount Draco like the blow of a whip across the face. He shook himself out of his hypnotic state and sprang to his feet. His face was red with anger and he poured upon Dr. Audlin a stream of such words that Dr. Audlin was surprised that he knew them. Apologize to that dirty little Welshman. I'd rather kill myself. I'm sure it is the only way in which you can regain your balance. Dr. Audlin had not often seen a man in such a condition of uncontrollable fury. He watched Lord Mount Drago coolly, waiting for the storm to finish. Sit down, he said sharply. Lord Mount Drago sank into a chair. For five minutes, perhaps they sat in complete silence. Then Dr. Audlin said, I thought a great deal about your case. I don't quite understand it, but I believe that your only chance to get rid of your dreams is to do what I have proposed. I believe that there are many cells in us, and one of the cells in you, is your conscience, has risen up against the injury you did to Griffith. It has taken the form of Griffiths in your mind and is punishing you for what you clearly did. My conscience is clear. I regret nothing. It was with these words that Lord Mount Drake left him the last time. Reading through his notes. He waited, Dr. Audlin thought of his patient. He glanced at the clock. It was six. It was strange that Lord Mount Drago did not come. He took up the evening newspaper. A huge headline ran across the front page. Tragic death of Foreign Minister. My God! exclaimed Dr. Audlin. He was shocked, horribly shocked, and he was not surprised. The possibility that Lord Drago might commit suicide had occurred to him several times, but it was suicide he did not doubt. Dr. Audlin had not liked Lord Drago. The chief emotion that his death caused in him was dissatisfaction with himself. Suddenly he started. His eyes had fallen on a small paragraph near the bottom of a column. Sudden death A.M. P. He read, Mr. Owen Griffiths, member of the House of Commons, had been taken in on Fleet Street in London. When he was brought to a hospital, he was dead. The supposed death was due to natural causes. Investigation will be held. Was it possible that the before Lord Mount Drago had last in his killed his tormentor, and that this horrible murder took effect on him some hours later. Or maybe when Lord Mount 
Drago found relief in death, his enemy followed him to some other sphere to torment him there. The sense thing was to look upon it as an odd coincidence. Dr. O rang the bell. Tell Mrs. Moulton that I'm sorry I can't see her this evening. I'm not well. It was true. He trembled as though of a chill. The dark night of the human soul opened before him and he felt a strange primitive terror of the unknown. The end. Hope you have enjoyed the reading.